Astronaut David Dixon's first mission to space goes horribly wrong when shots are fired on a Russian space station. He finds himself making an emergency landing from orbit and becomes the most wanted man on Earth. This is the podcast that gets lit, episode number eight. Let's get lit. So I know you guys don't get to see it, but we definitely dance off scene, uh, off screen uh, when our, our theme music <laughs> plays. That's uh, Ninja Tortoise. You can find it on YouTube. It's awesome. Uh, this is the podcast that gets lit with Bailey and Luke. Uh, we are talking about Station Breaker by Andrew Main today. Uh, this book came out almost exactly. I don't know. Today, today is February 9th, 2021. We'll talk about when this book came out uh, pretty soon. But if you're new here, welcome. We kindly ask you to like and subscribe to our channel. We truly appreciate it. If you've been here before, welcome back. We've got a great book to chat about. So with that... And if there was any confusion, I'm Luke and he's Bailey. It's, yeah, don't don't be confused on that. That's that, sh that should be obvious at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I just said it's, it's both of us. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah, one or the other. Refer to us both. We'll probably both answer. Yeah, at this point, might as well. So, yeah. Um, before we get into what we're drinking here on our boozy podcast, our our boozy book club, uh, this book, Station Breaker by Andrew Main, came out February seventeenth, twenty sixteen. So almost exactly five years ago to the day. A week off. If we'd have seen that, maybe we'd have pushed off a week, but. Uh, that's okay. We've pushed <laughs> off enough from uh, other <laughs> weeks that we're supposed to record, but that's okay. So this book itself was 384 pages, which is audio book wise, 10 hours and 40 minutes, a pretty quick read, uh, in my opinion. And um, so before we get into the Goodreads synopsis, Bailey, what are you drinking for our boozy book club this week? Well, I don't know. Let me go stick my hand in the beer fridge to and the beer see fridge. what we bought. To the beer <laughs> fridge. Just conveniently right across the room. Conveniently right there with, with the beautiful light set up, up up above. Boom. Oh, you betcha. We got it. We got to set the mood. <laughs> so we have a Golden Road Mango Cart. Golden Road Mango Cart. Nice. I am drinking Scotch by Highland Queen Majesty. So... Cheers. Slosha. We could have been twinning. I've got scotch on the bookshelf. Oh, you've got lots. Because of... everyone keeps their scotch on the bookshelf. You have, in all honesty, a lot of scotch unopened on your bookshelf. And all of it is I... book themed, <laughs> to be I fair. I have 10 bottles of scotch in yeah. here that are unopened. <laughs> and all book themed, right? Absolutely. That's the only scotch to buy. Yeah. Well, there's also other <laughs> no, that's scotch. That's not too. true. <laughs> there's yeah, plenty there, of there's scotch to buy. Scotch. <laughs> So we hope if you're enjoying a beverage as well that you sip along with us because we will certainly uh, be doing that while we talk about this book. So the Goodreads synopsis. I'll, I'll read the first part again and go into the, the whole hook here. Astronaut David Dixon's first mission to space goes horribly wrong when shots are fired on a, a Russian space station. He finds himself making an emergency landing from orbit and becomes the most wanted man on Earth. Desperate to unravel the plot he's found himself in, he takes his pursuers on a wild chase from space to the back streets of Rio and beyond. Dixon's survival relies on his skills as a pilot and a willingness to do whatever it takes, from crashing a passenger jet in the Mexican desert to pulling off an incredible heist in low Earth orbit. If space doesn't kill David Dixon, Earth will. So, I guess my quick question for you, Bailey, it is for after reading this, is that a good synopsis of the book? A, a good hook into the book, at least? You know, I would absolutely say so. Like, it covers, it feels like almost every crazy thing that happens in this book. Like, it, this book takes us so many places. And, like, just when you think it, it's as crazy as it could possibly get, 
but wait, there's more. <laughs> I will say this book absolutely maybe goes a little absurd with things at times, uh, but I think the the one overall theme I'll qualify all of this book with is it's very much like sci-fi, short-term sci-fi meets Jason Bourne is very much what it feels like. Uh, it's action-packed. It's definitely more like movie blockbuster feel of like, yeah, we're not going to see Iron Man do all the things he's really doing in whatever movie. But guess what? It works on screen. And that's how I feel about this book. You just kind of have to buy in. It, it kind of like gave me the Martian vibes. Absolutely. Yep. Definitely. Yeah, like just that kind of like very close future, but then like also, I don't know, space war, if mm -hmm. you will, kind of. <laughs> it's like yeah. Space espionage. <laughs> yeah, but like you said, it's near future, so it's still very similar political parties, worldwide, global entities that we're familiar with, so you don't have to yes. develop all that stuff. It's near enough, and all the players are essentially the same. Uh, it feels natural, like this really could happen in 10 years kind of thing. And I know in the preface of the book, basically all of the technology that's talked about, obviously it's blown up to an ex ex extravagant style, but all of the technology is either in testing or in practical use currently. So that's that was one of the main points that Andrew Main put into uh, his writing of this book and this series in general. But We'll we'll move past that. So, first thoughts, Bailey. We can either go scene by scene, or if you want to toss off onto some of your major overall thoughts. Um, either way, either way, you want to go with it. You know, you it is your book. I will let you drive this conversation. <laughs> All right. So I, I did I did put together a bit of a chronology of the book into sections a little bit, and obviously this is a spoiler filled podcast uh we're reviewing the book and going into a lot more detail than you would on a spoiler free thing so if you haven't read it go re go check it out uh you can check out the link in the description below and get a free audiobook and you can make it this one if you like um so the first section is what i'll call you know the instigation right it's it's setting everything in motion we we get the blast off actually on a rocket ship and an initial station break. There's also all the way through breaking their station and landing in Brazil and an incredibly exciting soccer stadium chase in an ambulance. So, Bailey, I want to get your first blush thought on how it's described on like when they're actually taking off into space and boarding the Russian um, low Earth, Earth orbit uh, satellite. I mean, like, kind of from the very, like, before the mission even starts, things start going wrong. Because our our, our main character, David, David, David yeah. <laughs> as the, the Brazilians refer to him, uh, but he he's getting ready to, to prepare to go on this mission, and he wasn't supposed to be there at all. He was an alternate, and he got called in uh, due to a last-minute uh, unfortunate injury of the person he was replacing. Um had a, a bit of a, a slip and fall during a sexual encounter in the shower. <laughs> all been there? As one does. <laughs> <laughs> so David's not even supposed to be going on this mission. He's been an alternate on like six or seven previous missions, and he's pretty much resigned himself to the fact that he's not going to be in space anytime soon. Well, this opportunity falls into his lap, and as he's you know, putting on his under spacesuit garments i guess if you will mm -hmm. uh he sees the the commander of this mission load a gun into his pocket and he's like, i don't remember that being on the approved list of things we can take into space <laughs> right he's like i don't even take my cell phone you're taking a gun like what? yeah and he's like, well you know maybe he's the commander he knows better than me uh but so right away, things start going wrong, which kind of sets the whole tone for how this mission is going to go. Mm -hmm. They they have a press conference before and, you know, there's some some awkward questions that are asked there that kind of put David in a you know, like in a, I don't know, like weird mindset, maybe 
you know, he it's, feels emasculated and not really up yeah. to snuff, even though he is fully trained to do this. He he feels outmanned a bit, it seems like. Yeah, and even he gets asked the question, how's it to be the only, you know, like, normal person going mm -hmm. up to space, not a former astronaut or whatever? And, well, that's the whole point of this, is to bring space travel to everyone. Well, this question was asked by a disabled person, so she said, well, what about people like me? He's like, I wasn't prepped to answer a question like that. <laughs> Luckily, uh, what Peterson, one of the other people on the flight kind of step in as as the heroic pro and give a really solid answer p you know pc answer uh that it's being worked on right like that's constantly it's one of our goals to make it space accessible to everybody that's part of what david is here doing is even civilians at this point and they're trying to push forward to everybody at that in a future time slot mm -hmm. So all of that that pre-flight aside, then they they finally launch. They're up there. They're they, you know, working on their trajectory to link up with the ship that they've gone to meet, and they can't link up with the ship because of what was it an, an airlock Technical issue? Technical difficulties. Yeah, something. <laughs> so yeah, some kind of no no response. You know, uh, things aren't working exactly right. So. They, they're in a bit of a holding pattern, right? Waiting to hear back from mission control. Yeah. Do we re-enter? Do we try to find another ship to attach with and, you know, go out and take a look at our ship's supposed flaw going on with it? Because at by, this point, by this time, the, the commander yeah. shuts David out of his computer systems because we don't really know why. Uh, but as soon as it comes back the commander gives control to the other person on the flight because there's three of them there's bennett peterson and david dixon and the two other people on the flight are kind of veterans if you will uh, of space travel and all this and this just kind of adds into david's Hey, what the hell man like what something something stinks i get that i'm the new guy <laughs> But something's fishy here. <laughs> so he he's instantly suspicious once he gets locked out of his computer system. And is pretty much told, like, don't touch it under any circumstances. Like, don't try to fix it. Don't try to do anything with it. Just leave it to the people that know what they're doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they end up, mission control ends up going through and connecting with a Russian space station, and they work it out that, hey, instead of sending this flight back to Earth, you can dock up with them temporarily until we get the other technical issue solved. And so they go through the motions of connecting with Russia. Um, there's a lot of stipulations that the Russian uh, government put on this of only one person can leave the capsule at a time, and they'll have a, a you know, a chaperone anywhere they go kind of thing. Um, so that also sets another tone of they're helping each other, but it's definitely not like, hey, we're buddy, buddy. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll let you on, but only because you guys are in a pinch. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And we're going to watch your every move. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so they do dock up and uh, yeah, tell us what happens. Uh, some more chaos ensues. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just the theme of this book. Is, it really you know, is. Something goes wrong, and then chaos happens. Yes. Um, it, so basically, our, our seasoned Americans go on to the Russian ship. And David doesn't know what's going on while they're there. And then he hears some noises. And Peterson comes running back onto the ship. And she says, we've got to go. We've got to go. What about the other guy? He's dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, then, so then Peterson, she hands David this black box and, like, goes back in. And we hear more gunshots and she's dead. Like, that's just it. She's just toast, right? 
And so now David has whatever this black box is, and he was just told, take this backpack and go. Like, oh, we're just, <laughs> let me just leave sure. in the middle of space. <laughs> like, what are your options? And uh, yeah, he ends up basically taking off in in the, the EVA ship that they were in, right? And now he's a wanted space pirate space criminal <laughs> he's the first ever space pirate is is i think i think he says that in this book that might not be mentioned in this book but uh spoiler for book two maybe uh but yeah he he basically becomes a fugitive in outer space and the russian space station is trying to stop him from basically re-entering earth's you know gravitational pull and well, get back within the atmosphere, and they shoot some kind of laser at him, trying to damage his heat shield on his way re-entering, and that was something he didn't know that they could do, uh, so that was a big surprise as well. Um, but while while he's leaving, he gets a message from uh, an unknown person who's giving him guidance on, if you want to survive... These are the steps you're going to have to take kind of thing. It's kind of like the classic, here's your mission if you're willing to accept it kind of thing. Like, okay. <laughs> this whole thing just seems so sketchy because, like, yeah, I just got a text message from a random number telling me, you know, do exactly what I say and you'll live. Mm -hmm. um, okay, sketchy person. It's either but that or go I with guess, the almost You know, like, guaranteed... given the circumstances, yeah. <laughs> it can't hurt. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it's basically choosing take an option or go with almost certain death, which, I mean, that's what it, he feels like he's up against staying there. So, uh, yeah, uh, he, he, he chooses the I'm going to go option and, uh, yeah, comes crashing back down to back down to Earth. <laughs> Quite literally. <laughs> yeah. So luckily, these are all reusable rockets with landing uh uh, landing gears but landing propulsion. reserves yeah landing propulsion and he goes through this incredibly risky maneuver off of the guidance from this sketchy text message <laughs> uh that basically he's gonna come down and then at the last minute like fire the landing rockets to then because he's worried about being tracked wherever he lands he's gonna get swarmed and all this so he needs to get close enough that they can see him, but then go somewhere else. So he fires the rockets. It almost like does like a evasive landing maneuver and shoots all the way across from the ocean, all the way across Rio de Janeiro and ends up bailing uh, mid flight in a parachute as well. Um, yeah. So that's pretty exciting, right? He's had a very eventful, like, 12 hours tops <laughs> probably yeah <laughs> yeah so he he manages to make it out and he's like well i gotta get some something different to wear because this clunky spacesuit is not gonna do me any favors trying to evade the police or whoever might be mm -hmm. coming after me and he runs into is it like children playing soccer in the street or well, something there, he lands or in like almost playing. what seems like a junkyard and there were three kids that walked up and basically were like, whoa. You're Iron Man. It's Iron Man. Like, in Portuguese, he figures out that's what they're saying. But, yeah, he's like, I guess my suit to a kid who's never been outside the slums. <laughs> to to of... some poor child that doesn't know about Iron Man. Really. Yeah, so he's like, I'm going to go ahead and roll with that. Like, that's, that's going to be what we're doing. Because guess what? He's clearly someone who knows who Iron Man is. And seems like it's a hero, so let's use that. Yep, you got it, kid. You found him. <laughs> so the police start showing up right there, and the kids kind of help him get out of Dodge, right? They they kind of lead him away from there and uh, end up, yeah, getting more information from kids playing soccer on a field because he's trying. One of the last piece of information that he got from the sketchy voice in the in the capsule was. You need to, you're going to land in Rio and you need to get to such and such soccer stadium. And so he lands in nowhere near a highly populated or uh, 
rich part of town and he basically asked them you know where's where's the soccer field and they take him to what's like almost just like a parking lot where there are kids playing soccer <laughs> because that's to them that's like their, their whole, soccer field that's their whole world pretty much but yeah they end up kind of helping him get out and he he has a plan to steal some clothes from a hotel at one point but he's also realizing again kind of a sketchy part of town guess what like they're used to people robbing them uh yeah not gonna be as easy as just walking up to the four seasons and taking someone's luggage who's leaving it laying around kind of thing so he's kind of out in the middle of nowhere rio de janeiro and still in a spacesuit when a couple guys on a moped go riding by and uh basically pick a fight with him and he kind of beats the crap out of him yeah and, and takes their clothing <laughs> yeah takes their clothing and their wallets and their sat phone which turned out to be a really use one of the more useful things he was able to get <laughs> and i think when he's beating these people up isn't there like some woman watching and she's kind of just like staring uncomfortably mm -hmm. and he's like, oh these guys were trying to rob me or like they're yep. bullies or something <laughs> yep, banditos and she's like Okay. <laughs> she just lets it go. Whatever you say. <laughs> yeah. So he, he takes the moped and the money, goes and buys or he has the clothes. He he he's got he's got the new pair of pants and you know, ratty t shirt or whatever, but he's got something that's not a spacesuit. I'm assuming he left a spacesuit in the middle of the street. It doesn't say what he does with it. Um I thought it did. I thought it mentioned that he like left it. In, like, some little hideout cave or something. Like, he put it somewhere and hoped that the kids would find it. Gotcha. And sell it for money because it's worth a lot of money. Okay. But, I... like, they probably weren't going to realize the true value of it. Mm hmm Okay. I guess I missed... I, on my reread today, I missed that part. Forgot about it. But... So he ends up taking the moped to what he finds out as the real big soccer stadium that he's supposed to get to. Has no idea who he's supposed to meet. Has no idea who to trust. Um... You want to describe what happens at the soccer stadium? It's uh, pretty extravagant. Uh, so someone calls his name, uh, and I don't know how he re realizes that it's not the person that he's trying to meet. Isn't it, that the way they pronounce his name? He's it's that's a part of it, but there's also a weird hesitation that um, it's almost like the guy who calls his name decides he's tr gonna try to do the friendly thing. And it's that moment of hesitation on that other guy, the work, the worker, he was dressed in work clothes, what he was, basically that was like the, one of those big Davids using his instincts and trusting that, that this isn't that the right that guy. That probably fishy. Yeah, it was yeah. just off enough. So he encounters this guy and like instantly is just like, nope, I'm going to run like this can't be good. So he, he jumps down one hole level of the stadium right it was like a 12 he, foot drop thinking, yeah he thinks to himself like thank goodness they taught me how to do that and you know want to be a astronaut or pilot or whatever it was school one of the things that he's done mm -hmm. in his life trying to become a functioning adult um but you know damn that really hurt my ankles like it didn't feel great but you know at least i didn't break one uh ends up running and hijacking an ambulance mm-hmm <laughs> With gunfire, because there were more people in the stadium that once the guy started shooting at him from where the level he jumped off of, it kind of triggered other people around the stadium to, I guess, activate and start realizing, oh, the guy that just ran across the field, like, that's probably the guy we're looking for. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, he ends up taking, a a, <laughs> taking an ambulance. Yeah, and he, so he basically tells the ambulance driver, like, give me your ambulance, and stay down because they're shooting at us and mm -hmm. thinks to himself you know it would be nice if this ambulance driver would drive because then i wouldn't have to worry about hiding underneath the the window and you know it is his job to save lives after all <laughs> <laughs> i love when he's going around he's almost like doing like a full lap around the stadium right he's never been here he doesn't know the layout and he he gets to this point where he like finally like makes a big break like a feeling like he get he's getting away and all of a sudden he realizes he just made like the literal worst thing possible and he goes up one of the up ramps 
and it brings him back up to the second or like one of the top tiers again and he's like no i literally just beat this level we're trying it again like no <laughs> it's not a good spot for him I think the funniest bit for me in all of this was when he's initially trying to hijack the ambulance and it's locked. And he's like, why on earth is an ambulance locked in this major soccer stadium? Like, who is going to steal the ambulance? He's like, that's literally what I'm doing, though. Uh, uh, me! <laughs> yeah. So he eventually does get out of the stadium and he's driving... Uh, quickly right with the lights on which helps as he leaves the stadium people think that it's rushing to get somebody else out of town out of the stadium to get him to a hospital um so at this point is when he has the money has a vehicle and actually goes to work on his disguise now how successful do you think his disguise was what you want to describe what he does You know, this bit is a little fuzzy for me. So he goes into a, this store and just kind of like nods and waves at people that are trying to help him and like is like point to like different areas of the store because he doesn't speak Portuguese. He speaks Spanish, which is somewhat close enough to be productive for enough him. Enough to understand. <laughs> yeah, to, the gist, right? There, It's passable. Um, but he ends up going and getting new clothes. He goes with kind of like a... I almost like a simple suit, something that's relatively nice, but nothing too extravagant. Uh, he ends up shaving his head and using some spray tan, kind of like temporary spray tan. And he realizes I should, it's, he has this moment where he doesn't almost think this, but then realizes it. He almost uses the spray tan before shaving his head. He goes, well, what Matt, but I've been pretty funny looking like, oh, like I clearly just shaved his head. <laughs> his pale bald head but like, yeah I mean it, it, for his options uh, given what he had to work with and yeah, it was this, awful especially the time the time stamp on it of he's got like nowhere to go and he's got to do something quick um, yeah. so he has this new disguise and he has this plan to basically catch, jump an international flight back to the U.S., right? And how how does he go about doing that? So he, he ends up meeting up with, like, a group of flight attendants, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, he, they go out for drinks, they're hanging out. And he, like, starts to get suspicious because there's this person that keeps, like, watching him, he feels like. The captain of of the flight seems to be asking him a lot of questions as more of like I took it as more of like the protector of the group kind of thing, like the, the father mm -hmm. figure in this tight group to protect everyone. But he, in his ultra paranoid state, is like, wow, this guy is <laughs> like after me. They're sure on to for me. the Gestapo. <laughs> like it's. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, yeah, he keeps getting these questions and he. He's like, oh, I don't know, maybe I should get out of here. And he's like, going to go to the bathroom and then figure out something. And on his way to the bathroom, one of the his newfound friends stops him. No, there's someone I want you to meet. Hold on, come back out here really quick. It'll just take a second. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out it was someone who was on a flight and working a flight crew and needed someone to assist in the, the crewing of this flight because... Whoever the person was that booked, I think it was like a private flight, whoever the person was, their wife did not want any women working on the flights that her husband took. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I think it was described as a uh, Brazilian soccer player that was, uh, yeah, his wife didn't want any females working on, on the flight, on this private what jet. What a shrewd lady. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like there may have been some issues previously. I will stay with you if. <laughs> so he ends up so, getting in with his ahead. crew and they obviously he doesn't have his wallet because who really usually needs to take their wallet to space he doesn't have a wallet or his own cell phone. Uh, and he's kind of worried that he won't be able to get through, uh, you know, security without an ID. Luckily, as part of the crew, the two 
pilots just kind of take care of it, and he's waved along with them through the executive side uh, to the private private jets uh, in general. And they get onto the plane, and David sees um, well, this wasn't a Humvee, but a, a large SUV come out of nowhere on on the tarmac, and uh, four Russian guys jump out and start opening fire on this on these guys. Awesome. As happens when you <laughs> get on a plane. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, he ends up kind of stealing a motorcycle that I guess they were also riding up on and takes off and is just kind of driving around the runways to get away from the SUV. And there ends up being two sets of police and security vehicles going along as well, which create some back and forth gunfires between themselves, which gives him a little bit of a reprieve, but yeah, he feels like, how am I going to possibly get out of, I mean, we know how tight locked uh, airports are. I mean, especially the runways, like you can't just drive onto him anymore. Um, he's like, I'm not gonna be able to pull a Steve McQueen and jump the fence anywhere. Uh, <laughs> but he does see a way out. Do you remember what he does here? <laughs> so, there, there's a plane that uh, was loading some some crew or some some people on the plane, and David decides to go over to this plane and basically tell them, "No, we need to get off now. Like it's an emergency. We have to go. We got to get back into the airport. Like they're locking us down." And so he helps usher everyone that's on the plane off of the plane and feigns like he's going to go down the ladder with them. I'm going to. And makes it about halfway down the ladder and then runs back on the plane and shuts it up. And <laughs> the crew is looking back like, our plane just got jacked. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Grand, grand Theft uh, plane, right? Oh, man. At this point, it's Grand Theft spacecraft, Grand Theft plane. Yeah. He even makes racking a, up the charges. He makes a comment about that, like, this has got to be a record for, like, dollar worth of <laughs> vehicles stolen. One, ever. And two... Yeah, like a $4 million... Or no, $4 million, $400 million airplane? One of the two. Can't yeah. remember if it was four or 400 Yeah. And the space capsule, I think he said, was a little under... Billions, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it was under a billion, but definitely hundreds of millions for sure. Uh, and it's like, yeah, like, because when I get taken to prison, like, I know, I know the, the pedophiles are pretty low on the totem pole, but like, what I'm racking up's gotta give me some street cred somewhere, at least not to be someone's <laughs> bitch day one. Like, <laughs> it's a good point. Like, I don't know. Like, I, it's a pretty interesting set of, uh, <laughs> I think I'd want to be getting myself out of all of these situations before I even thought about like where I'm going to be in prison because <laughs> of what I'm doing. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. <laughs> so luckily, he has spent his childhood playing a ton of flight simulator, and he—I mean, his passion has always been to be an astronaut and to be a fighter pilot. He's done tons and tons of test piloting. He ended up working through high school to get LASIK surgery because his eyes weren't great, and at that time, uh, the Air Force or Navy weren't taking LASIK candidates, so it was kind of like well, shit, I guess I can't do the thing that I wanted to. So he ended up going into these other things, uh, like being a test pilot and working his way up through learning how to be a pilot. And So he's flown 777s uh, a, a lot, is, is what it's described as. So it's almost second nature to him. Uh, definitely not the easiest thing to do by yourself in real life, but he ends up being able to do it and successfully takes off and radios in to the control tower that I'm going to Los Angeles. I'm taking off right now. Luckily with all the other hullabaloo, no one else was on the runway because everyone's been kind of shut down. Um, but he says, yeah, there are passengers on plane, hangs it up. <laughs> Just does like turns the radio <laughs> off completely. I have hostages. <laughs> yeah. And then proceeds to run through the plane to close eh, windows here and there so that if anyone does happen to uh, pull up next to his plane midair, they're not going to look in and see, that guy doesn't have anybody on this plane. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just shoot him down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that was his main concern, right? But if there's hostages, that's a different 
different conversation. So he successfully takes off. He does get some visitors uh, from fighter jets from Brazil and then Colombia and then several other Central American nations along the way. Um, he, he realizes as I get closer and closer to the United States, the more difficult and difficult, impossible this is going to be because they're literally the best kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I have to do the things that they tell you never to do so that he can throw them off his scent a bit, right? So he goes into a pretty deep nosedive and gets underneath radar over international waters. And, yeah, then ends up... Anything else in there along the flight? He he takes a nap at one point because it is a long time. <laughs> and he finally gets to a spot where he's like, Oh, they're either going to shoot me down or not. Like, I'm going to take this advantage as well as I can to rest up. Uh, <laughs> he's already had a pretty long day, let's be honest. Yeah. Other than that, yeah, I, he just kind of hangs out on the plane for a little bit. Um, and then gets back over Mexican airspace. And is his idea is to fly into basically El Paso and land in the Rio Grande River is the plan. <laughs> uh, because it's dried up, and it's a safer, not highway, be seen kind of spot. Any any thoughts on that and what happens? Well, as we've learned, nothing goes to plan in this book. Right. So he should have planned for something further down the line, and maybe he would have actually gotten to where he wanted to go to begin with. <laughs> Um, he gets contacted by, at this point, what is it, U.S. agents in, in a plane? Or, or is it Mexican agents? It was, Some, it was they were U, U.S. pilots that fly up next yes. to him and they give him, they flash him yeah, some morse They pretty much give him the, the ultimatum that, you know, turn on your radio to this frequency and talk to us. Like, I'm not doing that. Right. And do it now or we're gonna, we're gonna shoot you down. I'm not doing that. I'm going to call their bluff. <laughs> yeah, and he does. And then this crazy green laser shoots into the plane, like in through the windshield of the plane. And at first he doesn't notice it because he's looking down. And then he looks up and he realizes it. And he's like, if I would have been looking up, you know, like I probably would have crashed this plane. Um, And it, it shoots into the windows of the, the planes that are flying next to him as well. And so they kind of take off and abandoned ship because they're not they're not trying to risk it mm -hmm. <laughs> um and he i guess he deduces that it must be some kind of russian technology mm -hmm. that they were able to somehow track him even though he flew under radar and you know based off of the laser that he saw when he was leaving in the spaceship like it clearly must be some sort of russian thing that's happening if because they didn't just do it to his plane mm -hmm. yeah it he thinks it's a Russian satellite that has tracked him and, and now has deployed this laser uh, as well, which, yeah, I mean, kind of saves him there uh, to an extent. I don't think that was maybe Russia's intent, but uh, if that's the case, it, it definitely kind of helped him because it did get the two <laughs> other got jets. the Americans off of his tail. <laughs> right, right. Um, which maybe that was their goal is to get the Americans out so that if he does crash, they can recover whatever they're looking for without American interference kind of thing. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and jump to he ends up crash landing across through the Mexican border, through the U.S. Mexican border. Right. <laughs> and he knows this because he literally has fencing on the nose of the plane. Yeah, and at first he thinks, like, oh, no, I've landed in Mexico. And then kind of common sense smacks him across the face. And he's like, no, you dumbass, I was flying north. I clearly have to be in America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I went through it in the northern direction. So he's getting ready to get off the plane, right? And doesn't really know where he's at other than south Texas somewhere. And it's just going to start walking. <laughs> north to <laughs> till he finds something when pretty quickly 
a Mexican Humvee pulls up, Mexican flags on both doors, uh, sand colored. He feels like it's part, probably part of their border control, uh, border patrol. And yeah, who who ends up getting out of the Humvee? But four more Russians, uh, and they kind of he sees this. He's like, well, uh, there's no way I'm getting out of this. And you remember how he gets out of out of that situation? No. <laughs> so he ends up climbing up into one of the stowaway uh, overhead bins for luggage, while they walk on to the ship, uh, the plane. And he waits until they're all past him, almost like halfway down the aisle, and he hops out, and then he pulls the emergency landing slide inside the plane and it like pins them to the ground because it's enormous and it just like inflates and covers them up <laughs> and that's how he gets out he jumps out of the out of the plane there realizes he needs to somehow prevent them from chasing him in the humvee and so he looks how can i disable this thing he looks in for the like the hood release latch and he goes, he realizes, oh, it's on the hood itself. There's latches on either side. So he gets out. He goes, I think I just saw the keys in the ignition. <laughs> Hell, this thing is still running. It's still running. Like, uh, he's like, you think after I've sometimes been Sometimes common sense is like the best answer. <laughs> right. He, he, he even thinks to himself, like, after all of the hundreds of millions of dollars I've stolen, you'd think I'd have an idea that, hey, maybe this is going to be easier at this point. And, uh, yeah, it ends up, he takes the Humvee and just leaves them. As one does. As one does. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of our, our second section. Uh, I feel like that's really about halfway through the book almost. Uh, a lot has happened for sure. Uh, but now things start getting, we're obviously on the ground now uh, again. And we're in, in the United States and it does feel like we're almost at like a different level of, okay, this this could be a really tricky um, as opposed to, oh, you've lost the sense of surprise on everything. Now it's more of a hide and seek game. So he drives north and ends up finding this little small town where he goes in and checks his phone the sat phone that he got in brazil to see what the news looks like and he basically ends up hiding the black box in a magazine dispenser and like sticks it in there with some gum <laughs> that he bought um yeah he almost gets caught there any any thoughts on that there were a few police officers like in the convenience store it was just one of those like near miss kind of things yeah, he goes in, pretends to be another form of law enforcement. We'll find him, because at this point they're looking for someone. Who are they looking for? So th that's 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 a little bit next still. That's when he's leaving town. Gotcha. But this is the point where he then goes to the baseball game, the little kid baseball game, to just like blend in for a little bit and like think and there's a nice little scene of like little kids playing baseball or whatever and then um a guy asks him for his newspaper that he just bought and he says yeah okay you can have it and david starts to leave and this guy says thanks david and he never gave him his name kind of thing that's pretty suspicious and i gotta get out of here <laughs> so this guy we end up meeting and this is vaughn who, in my opinion, is probably one of the scariest individuals we come across in the book, I guess. Probably one of the more thriller, scarier scenes, I guess. Yeah, it's just very, like, intimidating. Mm -hmm. He tries to play a, a very buddy-buddy role, like, oh, I'm just here to get you out of this, man. Like, I, I'm, I was sent here to, to help get you and keep you out of trouble kind of thing where this is all going to blow over. You have no idea what's going on. You're the victim here. I'm here to help you. You just tell me where the black box is and I'll help you out here. Have a beer. They, they end up driving him to a black site out in the middle of nowhere. Um, 
and David's really starting to get the feeling that the, I might not ever leave this place. Like, uh, this could just be it for me. Uh, no one knows I'm here. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, that's absolutely true. And he knows that his only saving grace is not telling them where the black box is. So yeah, Pretty much, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, what black box? Mm-hmm. And David, plays dumb. <laughs> he, he does play dumb, and he eventually kind of puts his foot down on like, no, that's my story. I, I, I don't know where it's at. And Vaughn has to start pulling some real strings, right? He, he, he kind of takes him, he knocks him out to start with. And David wakes up 45 minutes later. And what, what's, uh, what's going on there? His entire body has been searched, uh, inside and out mm -hmm. if if you will uh if you could hide it they would have found it <laughs> pretty much <laughs> and if they've done scans and whatnot and you know like you have to tell us where this box is because clearly it's not on your person <laughs> mm -hmm. he also <sighs> seems to have drugged him with some kind of inhibition removal drug if you will it's very much like it almost, almost felt like a, like a truth serum type mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and luckily one of the things david was when he was growing up to get money in college to pay for his lasik was a test dummy a, a, a what's the word i'm looking for a, like a God, what do they call it? Like what? The, what's the rodent? Like a test that, rabbit, like... right? Test, test, yeah. test rat for uh, basically like drugs and like other pharmaceutical companies just to just to pay the bills kind of thing. And uh, it's almost like because of that, and just his it doesn't affect him as much. Either that, or he's aware of what it's doing, and he's actively trying to fight it to an extent, and. At the end of it, I'd say he's successful. Yeah, like he he kind of quickly realizes that there's ways he can skirt around it mm -hmm. in certain situations. Right. Yeah. Like focus on if he says two different things, focus on the one that's unrelated to the box. Yeah, I know what your cell phone is. You just showed it to me, kind of thing. Like, no, I'm talking about the fucking box, David. Come on, focus. We're talking about the box. He's like. <laughs> Yeah, I remember the box. You told me about it like 10 minutes. He was just like <laughs> focusing on not necessarily lies, but truths that weren't what Vaughn was looking for. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, it ended up working for sure. So Vaughn takes the torture up to a different level, doesn't he? A bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Why don't you tell us about it? So he he takes David out to the tarmac. That's kind of their private, where they they have their Black Hawk helicopter, and proceeds to threaten him with dropping him out of the helicopter. Starts at like five feet, and then, then he goes up feet. to ten feet, <laughs> and then he goes up to fifteen feet, and in yeah, I mean that already like. In my opinion, one of the more unrealistic things in that you can only go so far. <laughs> well, that and like he lands perfectly on his back every time. Like, uh, I don't know. Like if you fall backwards, guess what? You're probably gonna fall on your head and crack your skull open, and he could like die pretty quickly. Like yeah. that just doesn't seem like no, a... and like it's just an an unrealistic form of torture because you can you can only increase your increment so mm -hmm. many times before he he is gonna die when you throw him out of the plane. Right. Right. And at, at one point, Vaughn is like, I might as well just take this you know x amount of feet up in the air and just toss you out now. And David's like, well, actually, you could take it a little higher. Like, right. The, the real ceiling is nineteen thousand. You could probably push it two more <laughs> if you really wanted to. Yeah. So David, at this point, has kind of called his bluff. Like, you, you're not gonna do anything worse than than what you're currently doing out of this helicopter. Right. And if you do, guess what? You're not getting the thing that you're looking for. So. Yeah. Okay. It's a lose lose for you. And, and he manages to make his way. To, to, out of a terrible situation, I guess you could say. He he finds a rock on one of these times that he's landed. He he's like, oh, thank God I didn't like hit my head on that because that mm -hmm. would have killed me. Um, 
and he he palms the rock before they they pick him up and put him back in the helicopter for the next time. Well, his rock is discovered, but in the tussle to get the rock from David, he ends up getting a gun from Vaughn mm-hmm. for his ankle his ankle pistol that that he had yes. noticed earlier. And yeah, proceeds to shoot him and the two bodyguards. Uh, Got out of another sticky situation. <laughs> she sure does have a lot of luck. I feel like a lot of luck for sure. Definitely, definitely. And he then proceeds to steal the Black Hawk helicopter and leaves them all there, uh, hey, bleeding out yeah, on the ground. Basically, tells the pilot, you know, give me your money. And yeah, give me all ID? their give me their wallets, all your phones. Yeah. And you're getting off the helicopter because I'm taking it. Yeah. Take them with you. <laughs> yeah. And uh and he he does. <laughs> he he takes the Black Hawk helicopter and flies and lands it somewhere. Um and then goes and rents a car. So now he's got money, he's got a car. Using using Vaughn's uh, driver's license and everything to be able to get it, he goes back to this is where he goes back to the he finds himself back in that same little yes. Texas town, and realizes oh well there's a lot of police activity around because they found the stolen Humvee in the lot the RV lot that he left it at earlier. He finds himself back at the same convenience store and he goes, just decides I either need to kind of shit or get off the pot. Either I'm I'm taking the black box or leaving it and hoping that nobody finds it. He ends up taking it and is very much like, I am, I have no idea what the next step is going to be. So he started thinking of who do I know that would possibly be interested in helping me? <laughs> like that I could actually trust. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty short list. And he does come up with somebody that almost backfires very close to backfiring he uh he ends up who's his initial captain bennett yes bennett so he meets uh bennett's son who is a a renowned senator had a very public campaign um and they get to talking about kind of the whole reason behind the mission that captain bennett went on Right. So the the whole story right now that's being publicly aired is that really Dixon is this terrorist who shot both of his crewmates and stole something from the Russian space station. Like that's the story that's gotten out. People don't realize that he was just kind of here by chance and thrust into all of this, right? The the unwitting yeah. party. Um I wasn't even supposed to be here. I was supposed to be here. Uh, and, and yeah, Senator Bennett kind of, when he first calls, when David first calls, he kind of screams like, why the fuck would I ever want to talk to you? You killed my dad. Like, but then he calls him back like two minutes later of like, you need to get a private phone and like, call me back. Yeah. Like get this number <laughs> because we're going to be, we're being traced. Right. And so they end up, yeah, meeting at in Austin, I think it was, University of Austin, Texas. Yeah, um, I believe so. And, yeah, this is where we get some more information about the real problem going on in Russia and a little bit more on what David is in possession of. Do you remember what the the political climate in Russia was like that kind of caused all of this? So... Someone in Russia created or secretly procured uh, some some really dangerous weapons, and they were keeping it a secret. And the the box is basically how to launch and detonate those weapons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the the part that's really difficult about it is there's two factions in the Russian government. There's, I'm not gonna remember their names specifically. I know one's Zhirov. I think he's the head of like the Russian space program and air force. And then there's like the president of the country 
who doesn't know that this secret nuclear weapon has been smuggled onto the Russian space station and there that the that Zhirov is planning a coup basically he he's planning to detonate this nuclear weapon or at least use it as leverage to get the president out of office so that he can take it by force and the whole original reason for Dixon and Bennett and Peterson's mission was to go up and find out if it's really there, if there's really something up there, and if so, try to prevent it from basically sabotage it in in one way or not uh, one way or another. And so that's where David didn't know about any of that, and we find out that David wasn't necessarily just picked as an alternate and all of this, but. Bennett, Captain Bennett, who emasculated David earlier, it made him feel like I don't belong here kind of thing in David's perspe- you know, perception. Turns out Bennett really respected David. Like this is the only guy that could manage the survivability. Taking this on without any knowledge of the situation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so far he's been right, but that kind of blows dixon's mind right like he's he's like i had no idea like i just thought like i was just kind of lucky luckily there and he didn't want me there kind of thing and it's almost like the opposite right it's like he wanted him specifically but he couldn't let him know too much because it would be dangerous for david's survivability it's on a need to know basis (laughs) yeah yeah uh so that's meeting the senator um we learn a little bit about there might be somebody in the United States who's knowledgeable enough to figure out what to do next. Uh, And they live in a very magical place. Uh, I would love to hear you describe uh, who this is and and where they're living. And we'll, we'll get to meet him in a little bit, but we learn about where we're headed at least. Oh, so we, we learn that we're going to Disney world. (laughs) Because, of course, Disney World can solve all of your problems. Pretty much. <laughs> this, this is a fact. Uh, so, th- this person that we're going to meet, they live, like, in a, like, secret remote cottage in a portion of Disney World's property. And basically, their reasoning is, well, where else is there better security? <laughs> right. Like, in- no independent security. For me here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So, oh yeah. man, that that's a place I would live. Right? Come on, that'd be awesome. <laughs> that would be awesome. So that's that's David's goal is to get to Disney World to meet this former Russian, basically spy that turned on Russia and has been working with the U.S. for years. He's retired, but hey, he's still a great resource, kind of thing. Um, so he realizes he has to get from Austin, Texas, to Orlando, Florida. He has this vehicle. He's not going to be able to get on a plane, so he has to drive it. And he also thinks, I can't do this by myself, even getting there, because, I mean, it's like full alert everywhere for this guy, right? Like on the run. It's not safe anywhere. And he reaches out to the same journalist that uh, asked him the really tough question at the opening scene, right? Or actually like the, the pre-mission scene, uh, the, mm-hmm. the handicapped, uh, yeah, qu- quadriplegic uh, reporter who's a total space nerd, right? <laughs> and uh, that is Lainey Washburn. I would love to get your thoughts on Lainey. Oh my God, she is hilarious. Like her and her friends are all kind of obsessed with space and, I would say that Lainey probably may be a little less into the the people of space and more just into, like, the mechanics of how things work. Um, but we find out from Lainey that, like, there's this whole rating system for, like, the the datability of astronauts. Oh, or, like, it, wasn't it wasn't datability. It wasn't <laughs> datability. Okay, their fuckability. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the AFI, the Astronaut Fuckability <laughs> Index. <laughs> Which, oh my god, like, I'm sure things like this exist for any sort of public 
forum position. Mm -hmm. But it was just a, like hilarious to. She's like, well, you know, you're like a an eight on that scale. And mm -hmm. Bennett and Peterson were ten. What the hell does right? that mean? Like... <laughs> yeah, and God, who was it? Someone was an eleven. He ends up becoming an eleven. The... No, but she mentioned that there were a couple people. Who was it? Not like Aldrin and. Oh yeah, probably I, I, yeah. I forget exactly who yeah. it was, but there's a couple like Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. They're eleven. Yeah, like, like the astronauts. Just like it's hyper just like they're, hyper they're prestige 11s. level, basically. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so she like she has read anything you could possibly read about space travel and ships and mechanical and like she is a wealth of knowledge and she is exactly who David needs to take with her. Yeah, absolutely. And it turns out she's also pretty hot, uh, which he finds <laughs> useful at times, all, in all honesty. Like, it kind of helps them get through uh, some issues. But um, he ends up respecting her a ton, right? And she's, yeah, a pretty great co-pilot for this kind of leg of the mission where she has no inclination of, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, the the <laughs> multinationally infamous David Dixon is going to come knock on my window, which he kind of does. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, hey. he like starts chatting with her via Twitter, I think, I don't know, right? Some like online thing. Yeah. And he's like, uh, look out your window, but don't <laughs> scream. Don't scream. And so what does she do? She just screams. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what else would you do? <laughs> yeah. But she ends up going along with it, right? He 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 invests trust in her because of kind of their instant um, conversation, and she seems to understand what's going on. And he he gives her a lot more information than I think he would have given almost anybody else who is, we'll say, a private, you know, a civilian kind of thing. She kind of shows her bona fides and is. He respects that and says it's either going to work with you or it's not going to work without you kind of thing. So I need you all in and I can't lie about it. So he places his trust in her and clearly it ends up working out. They they make it to Orlando and that's where we, we go into Disney World um, and meet Markov, the uh, former Russian spy who was I thought he was pretty cool too. I, I thought he was a pretty cool character. He was a quirky dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I bet he'd be fun to have a couple beers with, or maybe some vodkas. Vodka. Vodka. Da. So <laughs> we we get into Disney World, and it's almost like this is our last hurrah a bit, right? We kind of have this back and forth. I'll just call this all a big planning stage of, okay, we have the box. The Russians are going to put together a kind of scrap together another trigger for this nuclear weapon. Uh, we have to do something to prevent that from happening. And we need to sabotage them again in some, some facet. And luckily this is a time period, which I do think we're getting closer to that space flights, rockets taking off. It's cool, but it's going to be cool. Like a commercial jet taking off. Like it's just kind of commonplace. That's that's where this is set in the future. Of it happens all the time. It's still cool, but it's not like the end all be all, like national news every single time kind of thing. So we have this big space space invasion uh, kind of strategy going on, and we meet Prescott, who is a Navy pilot who is going to be flying this mission up to the Russian space station to sabotage the creation of a new trigger, basically. Any thoughts on all yeah. of the planning? And it, It's a lot of detail work, I think, but there's some interesting things that happened there. I, I, thought, the, I thought Prescott was an interesting character and how that kind of all panned out. Yeah, I... I... I don't know. I guess like just the the whole setup of what was going to happen and kind of what their overall mission was going to be helped clarify in this sort of final scene of what's going on and that 
the detail of you know because th- things get a little crazy so it is kind very of knowing that the oh, gist of their mission gives you like a, a baseline of where we are in the plan later down the line mm-hmm. and again this is still only like he just landed in rio yesterday kind of thing it, and like really hasn't slept <laughs> No, like that nap he took on the plane was about it at this point. He he was passed out for 40 minutes in Texas uh, before being dropped out of a helicopter, but that hardly counts. Um, yeah, so I think this is a cool spot here because then we meet several other military folks who are involved in this plan. And David is able to actually kind of check himself a little bit here on like, wow, you guys have no idea what I've been through. And they're like, we realize that, but guess what? No one's going to care who you are in, in two months because there's other, there's bigger things going on. Like you're going to be a a small footnote in this whole story. In this story. Yeah. And like, I think he somewhat needed to hear that because he realizes, yeah, even though I've had probably, some of the most incredible two days of experience of all time, it really isn't going to be that big of a deal. Like my job is pretty much done. Now this team is really ill-equipped for this and I need to train, (laughs) I need to train Prescott how to do this, how to go up into space when he's never been in zero G and he's like the only resource they have for the astronaut side of it. And luckily they have Laney who's, yeah, a technical genius uh, on their team as well. But I, I, I like I like the interaction that they that they get there because I think David needed that kind of st- he's in a safe spot for the first time, and it's like instantly mm-hmm. he's able to realize there are bigger things going on, and I think that's good for him. Yeah, well, and really throughout this whole debacle, he has been like at the center of it. You know, he's been the one in the trenches and fighting and running and doing all of this to, you know, for a while, he didn't even know what he was doing it to save it for. Um, Right. Right. And so now like he's got a team of people behind him that, you know, like we'll take over some of this, this heavy lifting now. Like it doesn't all have to be you. You can take a breather and, you know, let us shoulder some of the work with you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Dixon trains Prescott uh, as well as he can over, like, a one-day period. I think they do sleep that night. I think it's the next day that they're they're going to be flying. Uh, they're basically just kind of finagling their way to getting this really hidden, special U.S. technology called the Dark Star, um, which has, like, complete light and radar absorption material all the way around it, so it really can't be detected. But they're getting that to be a payload on the next rocket that takes off from uh, iCosmos, which is the the space company that David flew on three days before. Um, so Prescott is 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 getting suited up for this flight, and I think this is where David also realizes like there, it's just like an impossible task. Like D- Prescott is in incredibly impressive guy mentally physically but there are just certain things that without the specific training knowledge there's no way this can work and then prescott asks david to take a picture of him standing in front of the capsule for his son kind of as like a i'm gonna die on this mission so can you hold on to my phone and make sure my family gets this picture kind of thing and it's like right there that David realizes I I can't let anybody else but me do this. Like there's literally no one else qualified the right way to do this. And two, like I can't let this guy go. Like it we don't know if it's gonna if he's gonna be able to if the, the uh the nausea pills are gonna work for him. We don't know if anything is gonna work because there's just no no data on it and he decides to take the helm himself. Go into space again. <laughs> he totally comes up with this full like bullshit story too of why he can't go, why Prescott can't go. It's yeah. Like, oh, you know when when's the last time you had a, a heart uh, cardiac like a stress test basically? Yeah. Yes. And oh, you know it's been 
what did he say, like a couple years? He said he never had one. He said, I've never had oh, one. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, when's the last time you went scuba diving? Mm-hmm. Oh, six months ago. Oh, well, you can't go up into space without having a, a cardiogram after you go scuba diving. Like, that's just, mm-hmm. no. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, I, I think there's probably a valid thought process there. Like, I think that probably was a real thing, but he's definitely using it as, like, a... The last here let me give you an excuse last so that ditch you don't effort have to go to basically clearly you're not ready yeah right like it, it it's just not the horse we need to be throwing up there qualified for every other part of this more than dixon because they're talking about going up there and incapacitating the two russian commanders on the space station who work directly for zhirov who were described as being oh what did he call them I forget I forget exactly what what he describes him as but he you know, he's like they're like 300 pound gorillas is what he what he calls them like <laughs> and like Prescott probably would have been able to handle it if it's like a true on earth fight but without any mm-hmm. kind of zero g experience that's it just doesn't make sense at yeah, all you don't just throw a baby into a cage fight <laughs> right right absolutely <laughs> Yeah, it could be the smartest baby you want, but yeah, guess what? It's a, <laughs> it's a certain skill set. So, yeah, we, we we have our second blast off in three days, and we find out who the mysterious voice was uh, when David was uh, retreating from breaking the station the first time. And do you remember who that was? <laughs> Do not remember who that was. So as as Dixon is sitting in the concealed payload portion of the rocket, Vin <laughs> the uh, literally riding with a a rocket an explosive between his legs. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was Vin who's the CEO of iCosmos, kind of like the Elon Musk character, if you will, the eccentric billionaire who has completely revolutionized even on top of what Musk and Bezos have done with Blue Origin and SpaceX. And yeah, so it turns out that that was, he he is also involved in this plan. And we find out that it was always, Vin was the one who said that David Dixon was never going to be ready to actually go into space. And technically, mentally, physically, absolutely capable but there was something about his selfish attitude that he didn't like what he brought to the teams that they had sent up previously. So he was consistently the one that nixed him from the fly list, if you will. Vetoed him. <laughs> right. But it was it was talking to Bennett that convinced Vin to allow him to go on this one. And yeah, it's almost like that, They called it selfish, but I think it's more of a self-preserving nature that has basically led to this entire story that we read. Um, Extremely uh, ridiculous at times, but yeah, it's like that specific nature is what allowed this to be possible at all. And Yeah, I mean, had he not been so self-preserving, he would have never made it out of space, let alone to Brazil and out of there and... Mm -hmm everything after (laughs) yeah and so vin allows him to go through with it it's almost like he sees a change in david at this point of like he's doing this for the a greater cause because he's already done all the self-preserving if you will (laughs) but now it's like for something bigger and i feel like vin finally realizes this guy does have that hero potential kind of thing Mm -hmm. just sucking yeah he he wasn't everything that vin that thought he was to begin with like he he's he has depth <laughs> right right so he takes off now uh, vin allows him to take off because he was like the last person that could have again canceled the whole thing and and all that but we find out he he was the voice that guided dixon in the first place to do all of the things that he did escaping into uh brazil at least mm-hmm. So yeah, then uh, we're we're up in space again. A successful <laughs> launch. I would love to hear you describe uh, David's writing of the Dark Star. Uh, his his one man 
rocket engine between his between his legs. Oh, just like he, there's this bit where he he talks about like I've got this you know crazy explosive thing between my legs, and I'm not talking about my penis. <laughs> Ironically, I'm not making a phallic joke at all. <laughs> Oh, it just tickled me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's definitely, like, childish humor at times. But you have to make the joke. Like, right? You it's have good. To. You have to. <laughs> I mean, when you, you're you potentially going to your death, does it really matter have if you're it. a little inappropriate? <laughs> have at it. That's what I say. Yeah. So he takes off in the Dark Star, which is kind of, it basically takes off from the main rocket. And they have to, he has to kind of take a long orbital tra- orbital trajectory around the earth to catch up to the trajectory of of the russian space station and we'll just jump through it he it's successful he's he's able to do it um and then he basically gets right up on them right and <laughs> I want to be on you. Is, I'm just gonna throw this out there. I, I need to get through that EVA. All right. I just, just let you know. You can take it or throw it right yeah, back. I, I'm, I'm coming on, regardless of if you throw it back. <laughs> so yeah, I guess tell us a little bit about how how it goes on. Well, getting onto the Russian space station and and forward. Uh, it could go smoother. It could have gone smoother. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's just, it's just, he bungles the whole thing. <laughs> well, the the one piece that he was counting on was uh, Markov's inside man or woman, if you will, was supposed to open the the airlock for him to be able to enter, mm-hmm. and it that kind of falls through, and we don't find that out until he's literally like almost knocking on the door, waiting for it to open. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's already uh, how doing do I a, get in if the like airlock isn't walk. open? Yeah. <laughs> so that doesn't go to plan. Uh, do you remember how he does get on, though? <sighs> no. It's pretty hectic at this point, in all honesty. After this <laughs> blistering... It's just like event after event after event after event. And then, hey, but the book's over. <laughs> yeah. So he ends up going through um, one of the other EVAs that had the previous shuttle, the Russian shuttle, hooked up to it and like luckily since they're out in space they don't have to necessarily lock the door i guess so he's able to enter the shuttle the rocket that's attached to one of the other uh airlock entrances and go in through there um he kind of has a little bit of a mission impossible uh scene here james bond in infiltration uh just to get on and not be seen but he eventually meets kind of the rest of the Russian crew uh, because it's clearly the two Russian commanders are the ones that know what's going on and they locked the rest of the Russian crew kind of in another part of the station. So he meets them and kind of recruits them a bit. <laughs> Makes some some fast friends, if you will. Yeah, definitely. To, to help him. Definitely wasn't the easiest. Uh, there was a lot of pushback, right? A lot of, why the hell would we trust this guy uh, kind of talk, but he's well, able why to Why the get... hell would I attempt this if it weren't dire? Right. He's able to convince at least the right people to the ones form that an alliance. Needs. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just kind of run through the rest of the, the book here, and then we'll do a little overall chat. But like he he ends up convincing the right people to help him, they create a little bit of a diversion. I'm just going to rush through this because it's hard to follow. They're crazy at, at this point. <laughs> it's very crazy. Uh, but he ends up kind of almost like a, a, a cat and mouse game with the two commanders. And he ends up back in the same shuttle that he entered through and finds out that's where the suitcase nuclear weapon was held. And they also talk about how one of the commanders has a dead man switch for the bomb itself. So that's why they can't just go in and incapacitate that guy because then show's over no matter what. Um, 
he calls back into station command uh, on Earth and is able to successfully disarm the nuclear weapon, uh, like almost no problem. Uh, just, just do the thing. Yeah, he just did it, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna, just, gonna just do it. Press the button. Just gonna, just, just gonna press do the, the green button. Where's that off button? Is this this is the one off? And uh, so oh yeah. no, that was the detonate. <laughs> So he, he disarms the bomb, ends up having to spacewalk back out again because there's not enough, there aren't enough seats on the shuttle to get the other Russian people, the workers, onto that shuttle and eject them. There ends up being a gunfight in Zero G where he's using this disarmed nuclear weapon as a body shield to an extent. Um, it gets really crazy, but that seems ill advised. <laughs> he checked. He said that he asked. <laughs> uh, it was apparently the way to go. Um, but yeah, he he ends up uh, he kills one of the. So he ends up using <laughs> one of the Russian commanders as a body shield as the other guy's shooting through his own partner to try to shoot David. And then is able to use his stun guns that are built into his uh, astronaut suit to knock out the other guy and just lets him drift off into space. And he feels like he's basically, that's it. Because he thinks there's not enough seats and I had to let the Russian people go because they're completely innocent. I came up here on a suicide mission to start with. And then Laney in his ears like, hey, jackass, the Dark Star is still like right there. Like, just go and get back just, on it. Just hop on it. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I think I'll try that. End oh, I of forgot book. that thing was even there. And that's the end of the book right there. <laughs> so I know I kind of blitz through the ending, which is it's it's worth experiencing for sure. Uh, it's just kind of hard to describe. It's like, hey, describe the action, the biggest action scene in the movie. Like, ah, just go watch it. Yeah, kind of de describe the, the Battle of Hogwarts scene for scene. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, overall thoughts on on the book here, now that we've kind of blitzed through uh, <sighs> the major scenes. Man, like, it was just epic, and it was action and like i did not pause once from when i started like i started it and i don't know three and a half hours later however long it takes when you're listening at three times the speed mm -hmm. and i was done right. and downloaded the second book instantly like that's how much i enjoyed it i was just like man i gotta i gotta know what happens i've not started yet because i did not want to confuse myself for today <laughs> I've, I've been there i have i have been there i was like oh man i gotta wait 24 hours before i can start listening to book two this is terrible i think we were both like that on mortal engines a little bit because we had both blitzed through all four books to an extent oh yeah and it was like oh no all right now i gotta go through the first one like, two times real quick just to in... yeah. just to just gotta solidify. Listen to it like 10 times right so. yeah yeah this book very action-packed and like you said it's a it's a pretty easy flowing book to follow like i i, didn't, I don't think it's it's a stretch for almost anyone to sit down and just crush through this and i don't think it's one to like super analyze necessarily and like spend yeah, like a bunch it's just of time a fun book it's just fun i i think when i described it to you i was like it's action-packed it's fun it's like potato chips you just just crush it <laughs> just just go through it like just just do it uh -huh. which for me is a nice break i feel like i tend to overanalyze books in general this one and I'm not saying that's a, it's a bad thing. Like it's it's a nice break from over. It's like super enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's fun. It's enjoyable. So, what was your number one love of this book? It could be a scene. It could be a character. It could be a line. It could be a segment. It could be anything. I would say. Just the whole bit at Disney World. <laughs> I, I I knew that as soon as I remember uh... it that happening. <laughs> I was like, oh, I know it's their favorite thing's gonna be. I'm a creature of habit. <laughs> hey, no, that's good though. What is your one love? 
I have a hard time with there. It's it's so like scene for scene, right? Like there's so many. This would be a pretty fun TV show, honestly. Like this, it would. It feels like a TV show, almost like a like a Prison Break, where it's like an unbelievable cliffhanger, and you get through it, but you love it because it's interesting. I feel like it would be one of those shows. Um, man, I, I think I really like Lainey and David when, when they were just together. And not that they were like a super significant romance or anything. They they ended up getting there to an extent, but it wasn't overplayed. It was subtle. It was clearly there, but not like the O driving desperate for love thing. It was just like, wow, okay, we really respect each other and that's cool. But I, I thought she was like the perfect character for what he needed at that time, right? And like it just yeah. worked out. I thought she was fun and funny and cool and her technical prowess is I mean top notch. So I, I thought yeah, that was almost, really I cool. Almost picked their their initial meeting as my favorite scene. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Look out your window. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's so funny. That's so funny. Oh. Definitely, definitely honorable mention, like, the Brazil stuff I thought was really fun, too. Just, mm-hmm. like, all the way from the crash landing to... <laughs> Hijacking the ambo. The ambulance around the, the, the soccer stadium is, like, the thing I think of probably first when I think of this book. Like, those two scenes back-to-back of the the crash landing and then this soccer stadium chase. Like, that's... I would describe those in my, like, own synopsis of the book as, like, the hook for somebody i think um what was something you didn't really like what was your one hate on this book um it's really not even a hate but just like a unnecessary thing but just like the the extra unbelievability of some Mm -hmm. things like there was so much of it that was believable so those few things that were just like really like you just disarmed it like that or you know, oh, I just happened to cross right across the border. Yeah, there was a couple things that were just convenient. I, I'm i actually going to 100% agree with you. I, there's a, a really probably more than a handful, but you just kind of buy into <laughs> it for a lot of them, right? Like, mm-hmm. there's a lot of things. Yeah, that, that could be possible. <laughs> but, like, for the story, right? Like, you don't complain about Harry and Voldemort's wands connecting at the end of book four. Like, it's just a part of it, okay? It's Is it unbelievable? Is it very convenient? Yeah. You just buy into it. Like, how many times can Jon Snow basically should have been dead? But he wasn't. <laughs> like, eh. It's just part of it, right? And mm-hmm. But there were a couple times where it was maybe pushing that envelope a little, a little hard. Um, yeah. I, I would say if I was physically visually reading this, I might have found some of the um, onomatopoeia that was written into there kind of annoying. But in the audiobook, I don't know. I it felt very like action film to me, where it's like pop, 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 pop. Oh shit! They're shooting automatic weapons at me now. Like there was a lot of gunfight sounds and other things yeah. that I think could turn people off to it. I liked it. I thought the narrator of the audiobook did a, a really solid job in general. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just maybe a little too convenient on a a couple really high level things. Like yeah, like those there were big reach. Yeah. But uh, I, I it's fiction. It's fiction. <laughs> yeah, I'm just buying into it. Uh any final thoughts? I will probably start book two as soon as we hang up this call. <laughs> so I guess the real question, I think I can guess your answers. As this is my book that I picked for you to read, would you recommend this to somebody else? Absolutely. Without a doubt. Cool. No, that's good. That's <laughs> like that's our goal, you, right? <laughs> yeah, like if you liked The Martian or a book that we'll be talking about in three episodes, I believe. Uh, Illuminae. Yes. The Illuminae series by mm-hmm. Jay Kristoff and Amy Kaufman. Mm-hmm. Um, this is definitely in like a hybrid between those two almost. Like it's a cross between The Martian and Illuminae. Mixed. To me, it feels mixed like. Mixed with maybe even a little bit more Jason Bourne. I, I feel like that. Yeah. I feel like that has to fit in there just because of like the action hiding not really knowing why like you're you're being chased but you just have to like just get away i need to save myself yeah i 
So no, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I I had originally picked a different book and pulled an audible because I, <laughs> I I pulled one that I had felt more comfortable that I knew you would you would enjoy this one. So I might have been dragging my feet a little bit about uh, starting the last. One. That's all right though. That's all right. I'll you'll eventually read that. I don't know if we'll make an episode about it, but um, I do recommend that book, Quilliper, in general. But not as easy to talk about in uh, an hour and a half, <laughs> I'll say. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we hope you follow us on the at on any social media at gets lit podcast that's twitter and instagram uh, also hitting that like button really does help us out a lot please make sure to check out the links in the description below this video and uh all of the links down there provide you different ways of supporting our channel and our podcasting company at the podcast.com you can buy this book and much more at several of the links below this show and all of our shows at thepodcastthat.com are produced with the love and support of you, our wonderful Imaginary Legion patrons. You can learn more about the Imaginary Legion benefits at patreon.com slash stayimaginary. And if you are not a patron, why the heck not? <laughs> we do hope you'll join us next time when... When I didn't prepare for what book we're supposed to be talking about. You know what book we're talking about, though. Oh, what book are we The Magicians by Lev Grossman. We sure are talking about The Magicians. Clearly, I was not ready today. (laughs) So give a short teaser. What's The the Magicians about? The Magicians is, imagine, in today's world, Hogwarts is real. Like, basically, that's the premise of the magicians these uh, children have grown up and they've read this book about a magical school and uh, they find out that this school is not just in a book it is in fact a real place that you can go and learn magic i'm excited another one that i've actually read but it I, i'm excited to talk about it Luke is way more prepared than me and like I don't know how to feel about this because usually I'm the one that's prepared and I've not read either of his next two books. I've read all of the books for the rest of our list so overachiever. Anyway until next time (laughs) just keep reading. Stay imaginary. Thanks everyone.